What's that you've got over there, my father barks? It's a book, I counter. What book? comes his brusque reply. Uh, I Biggles by Captain W. E. Graves, I repost. Captain, eh? That sounds better, he re reposts and slams the engine into third. The plane banked sharply to the left as we hurtled downwards, but the Fokker Wolf was still on our tail. Ah! Zing! went the twin cow mounted Mittelschmerz 25 mm cannons. Peng! it went in German, as one of the shells bit into the sleek wooden fuselage. Peng! cogitated Biggles. That's German for bang. We've been hit, volunteered Ginger grimly. Nothing, said Biggles grimly, as he slipped his leather gloved hand over the by now moistened joystick. He pulled it back in a series of sharp jerks. Level off a mo, put in Algy dryly through drawn lips. He stepped purposely into the body of the aircraft, past the by now shapely nude lady navigator, and back into the rear of the plane. The door of the gent's only sauna hung precariously from one hinge. He slammed it shut with a haunting squawk and fought his way past the two naked wafts wrestling in perfumed sump oil. He erupted into the aft leather room to find Winko still chained to a cross, wearing the by now familiar black hood, bearing the also familiar Wing Commanderic braid. Have your way with me, you hunk of manhood, he hinted coyly. What ho, old sport, hazarded Algy gingerly. I say, old man, the group's a bit dashed worried. Thinks you might have some kind of, well, you know, problem, you old bison. He fingered his cigarette nervously. Don't worry about me, old tapir. I've pulled through a lot worse than this. The plane lurched suddenly as Biggles swerved to avoid a hail of bullets that pumped in spurts out of the penis-like nose cone of the pursuing Fokker. Algy rushed forward. Everything OK, Skipper, he admitted. We haven't made it yet, inserted Biggles. as He gritted his thighs and plunged his machine into a savage spin. As they plunged downwards, the mighty engines throbbed and the well-lubricated pistons thrust themselves back and forth in their vice-like sheaths. You look a bit green around the gills, old Eland, observed Biggles smoothly. Never felt better, puked Algy. Sorry about the mess, he opined. Why can't you just say things, snorted Biggles. Tell you what, old man, having a bit of trouble with this one, could you just pop your hand down my May West? If it's an order, old Gillimot. It is, grinned Biggles. Right ho, here it comes. Algy plunged a questing, sensitive hand into the group captain's flying jacket. The plane soared upwards. Don't stop now, I'm nearly there. So am I. Ooh, ha, ah, ha, ah, ejaculated Biggles and Algy together. They were through. The white silence of a cloud surrounded them. What about me, rasped Ginger? Fuck off a sec. Ooh, ooed Biggles and Algy. Then suddenly they were through it. Peace, calm, ecstasy. They floated as one in a post what can't be described in a children's book sort of feeling. Ginger had missed out again, but he was used to this, and easing himself back into his cold leather chair, mused, to heck with a lot of them. I'll just jolly well sit down here and improve the bally old mind a little, don't you know? Languidly, he cold-chiselled his way through the padlock on his air survival reading kit and snapped the seal of the 2.5mm file containing the tincture of cricket pavilion. He clicked it neatly into the glue-sniffing socket on his oxygen mask and ran his rapidly glazing eyes over the emergency in-flight reading list. The complete works of Captain W. E. Johns. How to speak English in other languages. The interpretation of dreams by Sigmund Freud. That's dashed odd, he thought. Hun yid lit. Must have a gander. Cautiously, he opened the volume and gasped as he read inside the cover. Happy bar mitzvah Algernon, old Ocelot. Keep off the pork. Love Aunt Rachel already. What? So that's why Algy always wore his swimming togs in the showers, the flipping bounder. As the subtle aroma of grass clippings, blankoed canvas and linseed oil swathed his olfactory organs, he flicked through the pages with curiosity. The theories of dreaming and its function. Hmm. Flick, flick, he went. Symbols in dreams, hmm, no. Sexual symbols in dreams, hmm, no. Sexual symbols in dreams, hmm, maybe. Then thwack, it was as if he had been struck nose before wicket by a cricket box hurled at full stench. Navigational dreams, spot on, chocks away, he enthused, and read hungrily on. 
In the following pages, I shall prove that the entire psychology of man can only be understood with reference to the science of navigation. Quite right, interposed Ginger. I remember a 35-year-old patient whose prepubital son was having recurrent nightmares in which he would push a raspberry up his left nostril and run into the middle of the lounge shouting pelmets. This caused such embarrassment that his father punished him by making him stand on a window ledge holding a whole punnet of raspberries. They became so heavy that he lost his balance and fell down the face of a huge white cliff in the shape of a gendarme's nose, after which he woke up to find himself inexplicably in the sea at the bottom of the cliff. In later discussions with the boy, it became apparent to him that the raspberries represented raspberries and the cliff was, in fact, a cliff. But to the psychoanalyst, the cliff is a glaring symbol of a navigational fetish. Man's life is divided into two phases. One, childhood, and two, navigation. Childhood is divided into the following stages. One, one, heavy petting. One, two, coital navigation. One, three, embryonic navigation. One, four, fetal navigation. One, five, neonatal navigation. One, six, infantile navigation. One, seven, the prepubertal navigational spurt. One, eight, pubertal navigational day. And one, nine, postpubertal navigation. The beginning of the marine period. The onset of Regan Wettertraum. A footnote. There would appear to be no equivalent in our language for this Viennese peasant word. The nearest would, I suppose, be soggy dreams. At this point, we come to the longer phase, navigation two, which we may divide with Aesculapius, Galen, Pantagiali, Nietzsche, Marx, Lendaten, and Hitler's dog into two one at sea, two two on land, two three in the air, two four other places. 2-1 navigation at sea may be divided into the following broad categories. 2-1 alpha on top of the sea, 2-1 beta under it, 2-1 gamma quite close to the sea but not actually getting your feet wet. Schul Wasserfusch Bekleidung nicht gestellt. Footnote. This Viennese student pork butcher's slang word literally means my god there goes a clever psychoanalyst. It is also an allusion to Twelve Bream in My Wellingtons by Horatio Nelson, Admiral, a puzzling title which Freud was later brilliantly to interpret as an obvious apostolic complex, in which Nelson himself plays the Christ figure, Bream representing the early Christian fish symbol, and at the same time an overt corruption of the word dream, quite common in navigational dreams. He was also clearly in love with an as yet unborn military rubber fetishist. Freud intended later to expand this footnote into 12 volumes, provisionally entitled Generals, Admirals, Oedipus, Vagina Envy, Fish, Christ, Masturbation, oh, and all sorts of other things like cucumbers, radishes, figs, donkeys, other people's bottoms, gallbladder fixations, teeth, snow, hash, uppers, downers, Bakelite underwear, sports commentators, pole vaulting, and the great Vaseline boom. But sadly, this was not to be. He died leaving Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber to translate it into the Broadway smash hit Kiss My Twat, an all-goat musical comedy. End of Side One Beneath Biggles, that's damned clever, he hemoptisized and read on. In relation to this, I remember a 29-year-old female patient whose exactly adolescent son was having recurrent dreams about flying. In one dream, which he was able to recall particularly vividly because he was on a youth hostling holiday in the Lake District and his red-haired companion in the bunk above him had fallen asleep dropping a navigational handbook which spiralled down and struck him on the temple, causing the rapid onset of wakefulness. A fictional aviator called Bigglesworth and his companions are attempting to escape from a Fokker wolf which is pursuing them and shooting at them. They are hit somewhere in the back of the plane, and Algy, one of Biggles' companions, goes to inspect the damage. It is not serious. After a routine exchange with a wing commander in the rear compartment of the plane, he returns to the pilot's cabin to report that all is well. There, his group captain is having trouble with his flying jacket, but with Algy's help, manages to sort it out and escape the pursuing fucker at the same time. A typical dream recall of a particularly exciting episode in an adventure story for boys, or... So it would seem. Let us look at the dream more closely. 
The first thing we notice is that the description is full of overt references to changes in direction. The plane banked sharply to the left. The plane lurched suddenly. Biggles swerved to avoid the pursuing Fokker, an unmistakable symptom of navigational obsessions. Note also the use of zoological terminology in their navigational exchanges with one another. Old bison, old tapir, and even old guillemot clearly indicating a yearning for a pre-rational animal state of existence in which navigation was not yet distinguishable from simply running around. The boy patient clearly identifies himself with the minor character Ginger, who is excluded from the adventure because he is navigationally inadequate. At this point, Ginger stopped reading. Ginger, he thought? That's me. Inadequate? What a bally awful tome, don't you know, what ho, old chap? He slid back the Bakelite window and grinned through steel lips as he watched the book hurtle in a plinth-defying spiral towards an angry North Sea. Clop! I had been struck on the head, causing rapid wakefulness. The Anglia was now parked outside Thraxted's fish shop, with my mother inside, engaged in the purchase of haddock, and my father saying, You've been bloody reading again. I haven't. Well, what's this in my hand? Oh, it's the Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud, probably his most original work, in which he discovered a way of exploring the unconscious and found that neurotic symptoms are like dreams in that they are a product of conflict and compromise between the conscious and unconscious states. He was able to... Is it? he said, as he thumbed through the pages. What's this? As a little girl, she remembered her older brother and his friends asking her to remove her undergarments and performing cartwheels, thus displaying her genitalia to their curious gaze. In later life, she... I've got the haddock. What were you saying? What's that book? Nothing. The glove compartment opened and closed. Nothing. Just a road map. Uh, who's Freud, then? He's an expert on navigation. He's very interesting. His theories of navigation, you see. Longitude, latitude, that sort of thing. Ah, well, that's enough of that. Let's get back to Mrs. Riches with this haddock. Right.